Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this all-star panel about how alternative payments are evolving to grow commerce and ensure customer success uh, in this new space post-COVID-19, or even during COVID-19. We are unfortunately not able to do this live, but it's such a privilege to be able to come here in a virtual platform to be able to deliver this to you today with my all-star panel. Now, before I introduce them, uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Ivan. I'm the head of payments for the Walt Disney Company in Asia Pacific. And it's such an honor of mine to be your moderator for today's session. Now, time is really short. We only have 45 minutes. So let's just jump straight in. I'm going to start introducing the speaker, and after that, they will each have about one or two minutes to introduce themselves and what they do. So let's get started on this all-star panel. First up, we are very privileged to have Navid here, the country head product management for HSBC Australia. Navid, welcome. Thank you, Ivan. And as Ivan mentioned, I head product management for HSBC Australia's cash management business, including payments. Um, I've worked in finance 15 years now across markets, in South Asia, ASEAN, as well as Asia Pacific. And I'm really looking forward to this panel session today. Thank you, Ivan. All right, awesome. Next up, we have Brandon. He is the head of product financial service for Gojek. Hi, Brandon. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, so thanks for uh, that introduction. Uh, so my name is Brandon, and I'm currently leading the product management function for financial services for Gojek, which is part of the wider payments group. Uh, as part of that, I'm mostly focused on the credit-based payments uh, for both Gojek ecosystem as well as the open loop use cases. Uh, glad to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Welcome, Brandon. All right, following up, we have Stephanie, who's the vice president for Billy. Billy, sorry, my bad. Hi, Stephanie. Hello, Ivan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm part of Bubu.com, one of the largest e-commerce platform in Indonesia. Uh, I currently have two roles. I am leading the business development team for consumer goods and also the trade partnership for beauty and health category. So glad to be here. Very excited. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Stephanie. Following up, we have Subar here, the product VP for Flip.id. Hello, Sonil. Oh, sorry. Hey, Subar, man. sorry. My bad. Sorry. Yeah. Shut up, actually. Yeah. Uh, hey, Evan, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be part of this forum and this group. Uh, I'm Saurabh, and I lead uh, product and design for Flip. Uh, Flip is one of the largest B2B payments company in, in Indonesia, and we are in the business of moving money. Uh, I've primarily worked in my career uh, in product management and consulting. Uh, started my journey as a management consultant and then transitioned to product management. So that's what I do. Uh, looking forward for this uh, interesting discussion that we'll have. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Sonal here, consumer lending and insurance at Flipkart. Hi, Sonal. Hi, Ivan. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonal, and I lead the financial services business for Flipkart. Um, Flipkart is India's leading e-commerce company, um, and we believe driving affordability for billions of Indians is a must-have, and that's what I focus on. Great to be here. Welcome, welcome. And definitely, last but not least, uh, Arman here, who's the head of payment partnership at APEC for Uber. Hey, Ivan. Um, good to meet everybody. Um, so as Ivan said, I lead payments for APEC uh, in uh, Uber. Been here for about four plus years. Feels like dog years, so a lot, lot longer. Um, been doing business development all the while at Uber. Before that, I was uh, focused on in an investment platform, creating the India US corridor for companies which were looking to land and grow their business in India. So a bit of venture capital and a bit of business development and now in the exciting world of payments. Uh, so good to be with you all and uh, part of this discussion. All right. So I welcome all our distinguished guests for this panel session. So we're going to start straight away with our topic at hand. Uh, and I think top of her mind, uh, is a pandemic. You know, we don't seem to be out of the woods yet. You know, the cases are rising, even as when we record this right now. And you know, it has been a shock to the entire world. You know, COVID nineteen, the payment landscape because of that has completely been redrawn. So we're going to hear from all our panelists here. What impact are you seeing from COVID nineteen in our exciting world of payments? Uh, you know, I want you were the you were just last book. Maybe we have you to start off first. What are the you know trends or impact from COVID nineteen in the world of payments that you're seeing? 
Absolutely, Ivan. So, I mean, the pandemic has completely uprooted how uh, we saw the world and um, how we did business. And of course, there's been a big impact on our mobility side uh, where people have stopped traveling. From a delivery uh, uh, perspective, there has been a lot of growth and a lot of uh, incremental business that we've seen. But the two points that I would like to call uh, or draw attention to is essentially, you know, if you look at uh, how cashless has become the norm, or you would assume that cashless has become the norm, um, that was not the case for us in the mobility side, especially in developing countries, as an example, India. Now, you would imagine why, why would people not use uh, digital payment methods, right? So in the COVID era, when people are traveling, they're not traveling because they have choice. The people who are traveling, are traveling because they are forced to travel and they have to get out of their house to earn a living. So we live in an unequal world was even more apparent in this ecosystem. And we saw that people who were getting out there were people who would usually use public transit, but because they did not have that safety or assurance in public transit, they were actually moving in, in low cost options that Uber offered. And the best thing that they could do is get into a two wheeler or a three wheeler in India, which led to them, you know, using cash because the card holders are the ones like you and us sitting at home, not going to office, not spending on leisure. Um, so it was very apparent to us that cash was increasing because the people who were out there were out there, not because of choice, because they were forced to do that. Um, the second thing that I would like to call out is essentially on the delivery business. Um, we saw a lot of growth and with that, we saw a lot of growth in subscription, a lot of people subscribing to food delivery, which is obviously the norm these days. And the demand that customers have on that from a payments experience perspective has just gone up and up and up, right? So of course the best payments experience is no payments experience. And uh, they want to have the most seamless user experience as they, um, you know, get the best, best uh, services from delivery, best offerings and, and everything which is related to customer support, related to um, the pricing. And of course, when it comes to the product experience as well. So we've launched and tried recurring payments. Uh, we've tried um, working with buy now, pay laters of the world. And uh, I think that customization is uh, going to increase even further as uh, uh, we see the pandemic playing out. And as people move in some areas, as they move more towards digital payments. I'm going to steal that line from you. Yeah. The, the best payment experience is a no payments experience. I think uh, that's certainly true. Thanks so much, Aman. Next up, you know, let's hear from Naveed. Naveed, uh, what are the impacts you're seeing from COVID-19 in the world of payments right now? Yeah, absolutely. So I think Arman touched upon this as well, but the most visible impact has been the shift from physical to virtual business models. And we have seen overnight e-commerce and m-commerce went from an aspirational growth strategy for, for businesses to a matter of survival. And we have seen that play out in Australia. In 2022 alone, online shopping went up by 57% on a year on year basis. So something that could have happened in five years time happened overnight and that's that's quite telling. Um, and I completely agree with what Arman mentioned that payments, the best payments experience is, is no payments experience. And therefore, according to me, payments is an incidental part of this whole change. Uh, businesses who were caught by surprise through, during the lockdowns, they were looking to set up a business, um, an online shop from scratch and they had no prior experience. And they started looking for partners who can provide them with an end-to-end -end solution from setting up their website, integrating with shopping carts, payment gateways, and ultimately all the different payment options that they can provide uh, their customers uh, that particular solution to. So for them, payments was just an in incidental side of the conversation. It was the whole end-to-end -end ecosystem that they were really interested in. And this, according to me, has been the biggest impact of COVID on payment providers that payment providers went from just a payment enabler to a business enabler. And that's exactly what we have been trying to do at HSBC as well, that working with our corporate clients and our businesses, it's the end-to-end -end ecosystem around e-commerce that we want to support and not, not just the payment side of, of the things. Understood. So end-to-end -end commerce uh, and, and changing the landscape with that. Thank you so much, Naveed. Um, next up, Stephanie. Hi. Hi. All right, thanks, Navid. Also, I agree fully with you because of COVID pandemic, there has been a lot of shift to online shopping, uh, e-commerce. So I'm gonna talk about Indonesia first. If you look back in the days, people used to rely a lot on cash, right? Especially when 
the transaction market was dominated mainly by baby boomers. Cards were luxuries, not many people have it. And then in Indonesia came e-wallets. It's so much more simpler, more convenient. It was meant to bridge the gap that the cards couldn't provide. But people were reluctant to use it because you know, baby boomers, they are not used to the transactions digitally due to data safety concerns. But in recent years, there were a lot of millennials who entered working force. They liked the convenience of digital payment and e-wallet also offer very attractive incentives. And you know, another driver for e-wallet uptake is that um, you know, the COVID-19 brought surging demand on contactless payments and people are shifting to shopping online as well. Now, at uh, shifting to see, uh, the trends at Blibli, we're seeing th three trends. Number one, there is also a shift towards more uh, usage of alternative payments. Um, it becomes more preferred. Before, there were not many people that use e-wallet in Blibli, but it's now rising up. And even as the COVID cases decline in Indonesia, the percentage of people that's, that still use these alternative payments they're not declining, instead it's increasing. And you know, the second trend that I'm seeing is that due to the economic constraint, a lot of people are experiencing tough times due to the pandemic. And there has been a rising popularity of buy now pay later. The simplicity and payment flexibility offered by BNPL makes it so much easier for people to complete checkout and still shop despite having a tough time at the moment. And the last trend that I'm seeing here is that, you know, credit card companies now focus a lot of their offers on everyday purchases like groceries, uh, beauty and health, things like that. Mm -hmm. and before, it was more focused on travel, uh, mobile phones, electronics, more expensive things. So it has completely shifted to daily, daily goods. So that's all I can share for Blibli and for Indonesia. Thanks, Ivan. Hey, thank you, Stephanie. And, you know, credit card company has also shifted to the world of entertainment. So remember to get your Disney Plus uh, on a, a credit card with all the offers in the region. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, let's hear from uh, Sonil as well. Hi, Sonil. Hey. Um, I think uh, a lot of my peers actually spoke about it. And, uh, uh, yeah, of course, COVID-19 accelerated the growth of digital payments, right? Uh, from cash of the king to... Uh, suddenly, digital money is the king. Uh, we just saw a shift, a massive shift in the last 15 months. Um, and of course, there has been a riding benefit to um, any type of online commerce company, right? Uh, because consumers were unable to get out of their uh, houses and therefore were looking at e-commerce. So even if there was a barrier that existed, um, you know, in the deeper pockets of the population, I think that barrier just went away on its own. So it, it was in that sense, you know, a great um, a situation to be in, um, right? But I think what has also happened along with transformation and payments is that there has been this entire credit landscape that has been moved by COVID, right? Uh, because COVID started impacting the financial stability and income continuity. Therefore, it ended up removing the barriers towards credit usage as well. Uh, now, when our consumers were actually using cash, what they were realizing was that uh, you know credit was not top of their mind, especially when they were looking to make purchases for um, you know, like like Stephanie mentioned, maybe for beauty and health and grocery. And, you know, the idea was that you start, keep using cash and, you know, you use credit only when you want to do something really major in your life. But I think that's a shift that we've been seeing in the last uh, 15 months, at least on the platform and especially in India as a market. So if you will actually see the credit usage has increased by close to, um, you know, 55%, uh, uh, right? Uh, and this is in the categories where uh, these are usually very uh, low average order value categories. So that continues to be uh, changing massively. Um, and at the same time, I think there is, uh, you know, there is a movement where uh, the focus is now on payment, um, not as the final point in a consumer purchase journey, but as a key enabler of a consumer purchase process, right? Therefore, there is an increased focus amongst the businesses to ensure that they are adjusting to the demands of shoppers as well, right? Um, so as we enter into some of these, uh, you know, uh, very latest years for online retail, I think there are going to be some very interesting solutions from payments, from credit um, that are going to come up to match buy preferences. And shoppers are very clear. They're looking for flexibility with how they pay. And COVID has sort of uh, gotten them to try it out. And I think uh, we'll only see this boom increasing for sure. I cannot wait to, to see the changes in, 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 the, in the landscape right? and ideally more, more upcoming trends itself. Thank you so much, Sonia.
And, and next up, uh, Bandan. Hi. Hi. Yep, I think uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, things that have been shared by uh, Arman, for example, uh, uh, actually are true. Gojek being a mobility company and being a key provider for on-demand services, we saw some similar trends. Uh, and some of the businesses uh, got impacted, but the ones that gained and the services that gained were mostly the ones that were providing services to customers who might be stuck at home due to lack of mobility. Uh, and some of a lot of uh, learnings that we got primarily coming from Indonesia market. Uh, number one was that, of course, transport got impacted uh, as the as uh, you know people were stuck at homes, lockdown, social distancing, and other restrictions. But food remained a consistent uh, driver, and even grew to some extent across payments uh, uh, for Gojek. Uh, the second trend trend that we saw is that there were some new services that actually started gaining traction. And this again, COVID was a big trigger. For example, logistics, right? Uh, people wanting to send uh, things from location A to location B, whether short distance, mid distance, long distance, that definitely gained a lot of traction. And secondly, online commerce, right? Uh, a lot of focus over the last year before COVID was, you know, both offline QR cases and online cases. But with COVID, we saw a complete shift from offline QR cases to uh, online ways of paying. And hence the focus became more and more on how do you remove friction across payment methods, whether it's debit-based or credit-based payment methods, how to make those e-commerce transaction journeys more seamless uh, when we saw this you know, shift happening from offline to online. So the entire COVID period for us was how quickly could we adapt to the reality. Understood. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Surah here who can close up our discussion on the first question, which is, impact of COVID-19 on payments? Sure, thanks Evan. I think I echo almost what everyone was saying. So I think we all kind of agree with, you know, how this transition happened, like acceleration of, you know, offline to online. Uh, so, so I'll basically make it brief and like give a real life example of this impact, right? Which uh, probably folks in Indonesia might have witnessed, right? And uh, to start off, right? Uh, well, we say that, you know, but there is a change in buying behavior. I think a bigger change is in terms of discovery. Right? While a lot of buying behavior has moved uh, online from offline, discovery is, uh, I would say, about 80% online. So people are discovering products online, right? And uh, so once the disc and this is not on e-commerce, this could be, you know, your food delivery, grocery delivery, logistics, all different types of business businesses, right? So the discovery of the same is happening online. And uh, it's not only that more people are buying online now, it's also that they are buying more online. Uh, like if you compare from 2019 to like 2021, or what is projected is there will be about three times increase in what people are spending online, right? So that that's quite quite a big increase, and that that's triggered by different factors. Like it's it's just people have just found it so convenient, right? I mean earlier you had to go out buy something, right? Now you can like you're working and you can open another tab and buy probably something, your food or whatever, right? So it's very convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, you have more options. Right, so you're not uh, you're spoiled for choices in a way, and obviously there are a lot of discounts as well, right? So, uh, so that's also kind of triggering this behavior, uh, and I think the key winners for this, uh, and if I can talk from Indonesia perspective, is I think the different digital wallets, and uh, I'll, I'll talk an example of how closely ecosystems are tied up, right? So once like this uh, this change was triggered, we saw a lot of transactions happening on different uh, e-commerce platforms, right? Uh, one of the key changes we saw here was in terms of different digital wallets, like Shopee became very popular, right? 2020, like Shopee was like, had a phenomenal growth. And because Shopee grew, Shopee Pay grew, right? So Shopee Pay from being, let's say, number five or some somewhere uh, in digital uh, wallets in Indonesia became number three in less than one year because of the growth of Shopee. So that's how closely payments are tied with the ecosystems, right? If your ecosystem is growing, so, so is the underlying payment method, which is being promoted there. And on the flip side, you can see like, we saw that, you know, uh, Dana did not scale that much because probably Bukalapa and Lazara did not scale that much, right? So that's how closely payments are like, you know, tied with ecosystem. They both like the growth of an ecosystem helps with the growth of a uh, payment method as well. Yeah, like, I'll end with that. So true, you know, uh... Singapore, uh, I, I, the only number I can share uh, actually is, uh, is from Singapore Retail Association. So in 2019, for the entire year of 2019, 5% of all addressable retail in Singapore 
were made online, uh, were made online 5%. In 2020, uh, it was 36% of all addressable retail were made online. Of course, Singapore is unique. A lot of the addressable retail were because of uh, international tourists. But I think that number alone is, is eight-fold increase in, in online purchase by an average Singaporean. I think it's phenomenal. 5 to 36%. This number coming from Singapore Retail Association 2019-2020 addressable retail numbers. Now, I think we saw that you know, COVID-19 has changed the world and we are now already tying on to a larger trend. So we've got time to talk about the next trend, which is cash to a cashless society. Uh, that has always been the undercurrent in Asia Pacific. Of course, COVID-19, I'm very sure, accelerated part of this trend. But more importantly, it, it was an undercurrent current, right? Everyone wanted to be cashless. So we want to know for our audience member, how can small, medium businesses of all stripes be able to take advantage of this? You know, we hear, so this first, we're going to start asking uh, Shiraz, right? You know, he talked about Shopee and he talks about uh, uh, Dana. These are big players, right? How can a smaller merchant, their mom and pop shop in, in the streets of Indonesia, even in Singapore, be able to take part in this trend and grow the ecosystem together with the payments ecosystem as well. All right. Uh, so let, let me start by sharing some context of like e-commerce as well, right? Hmm. Uh, like how, how has this trend changed? Uh, so since the pandemic began, right, about roughly in Southeast Asia, about 70 million new users moved online when it comes to their purchases, right? So that's the amount of new users that are there in the ecosystem, people who never purchased, right? So there's definitely an acceleration. And you'll see that I think the key beneficiaries you can say have been the larger players, which could be your, you know, Tokopedias, Lazadas of the world. Uh, but there is also a kind of, a, you know, a flywheel factor here. So if you have more products online, you know, uh, more users will go there, more users will go there, more merchants will want to sign up with, with them, right? So there's a loop which has been formed. Now, uh, while I think we all think of these large players, if you just look at the numbers, right, uh, in terms of uh, uh, population, and if I can talk about Indonesia, there are 180 million people who are on social media platforms. I mean, that, that's a, this is a large addressable market. And even before the pandemic started, right, social selling was, was, was already popular. Uh, in fact, if you look at the total online, uh, like uh, if you look at the total overall like, uh, transactions which happen, about 40% of them today are also happening through different you know, social mediums, right? Which, which are not through your large e-commerce player. So this trend was already there and it got accelerated because not only did consumers wanted to reach out to different you know, online businesses, merchants also wanted a way to reach out to consumers, right? It was a small, small, like say mom and pop store, SMEs, right? Mm. Who had let's say small shops somewhere and no one is coming there anymore, right? How do, what do they do? Right. They also need to reach out to the consumers, right? So it was it was like a like a two way two way change where consumers also wanted more options online. Merchants also wanted to reach out to the consumers in a way. And uh, if you look at these uh, merchants, like a lot of them are actually uh, do this as a side hustle as well. It's it's very common. Like you have a normal uh, like nine to six job, and then you have a side hustle as well. So. When they want to reach to consumers, the key problem for them is obviously payments, right? Uh, they can't do cash collection. COD is not an option, right? So what do we do? So they all have problems around offering their consumers a variety of payment option, uh, having like uh, the cost of these payments should be super low. Uh, and if possible, there's some a guarantee for the payment, right? In a way where uh, uh, they, there's an escrow account or something like that. So they, so they are sure about this, uh, uh, that the payment will reach them, right? So these are some of the problems. And uh, I would say for, for initial uh, pandemic period, somehow they, the, this segment got ignored uh, and everyone was focusing on, you know, how we tie up with larger players, you know, do these integrations, whatnot. And these small merchants, they don't have bandwidth or they don't have capacity to do, you know, get a, get a payment gateway integrated to accept payments, right? Uh, so so, so they, they were at a loss where you know, a lot of consumers did not want to use them because they didn't have a lot of payment options to provide and so on and so forth. But that dynamics is changing now. So if I can talk about last six to nine months, uh, I think there is an acceptance that uh, building product solutions for this segment of users is going to be the next big thing. Uh, uh, and there are companies providing solutions for that. I mean, we at Flip are also, you know, right now doing a beta uh, where you're providing this sort of a platform for them where it's very easy for them to accept payments, you know, do some sort of basic reporting, have some sort of, you know, dashboard available. So they know, you know, what are the receivables, you know, and things like that. Right. So, 
So for these segment, I think a uh, lot of innovations are in the cards and they will be one of the key drivers. And I would not be surprised like if we have a couple of uh, unicorns just focused on accept payments for, you know, the small merchants coming up in the next couple of years uh, because the market is wide open right now. Open field markets, SMB should be listening out and hearing. That's why I, I, I summarize from you. Thank you so much, uh, Shirat. And Avan, anything else to add from your perspective? How can SMBs take advantage of all of this growing trend to go from cash to cashless? Yeah, no, again, I think, you know, this is one segment which is um, struggling to survive in the pandemic, right? So digitization for them is, is not a choice. It is survival, right? So um, again, I think we need to look at it from that lens and uh, there needs to be handholding that we provide as big merchants, big payments players, uh, and create that ecosystem for them so that they can step into it and utilize the benefits of it. But at the same time, and not being charged too much and not uh, being intimidated by the uh, integrations that they have to do, the hardware setups and the software setups. Uh, the lockdown uh, and, and the lack of footfall creates a lot of unreliable cash uh, flows for them, right? Um, digital payments will create continuity uh, and will create uh, sustenance, which is very, very important. So just as an example of what actually we did uh, not specifically on payments, but of course we did provide digital payments to mom and pop shops, but also providing last mile delivery for anybody out there, not just food delivery. Um, you can deliver an iPhone, you can deliver flowers, um, you can deliver cake, um, your shop could be producing anything. And if you need a digital ecosystem around you to create business in this environment, I think that was the most important thing that everybody was trying to solve for to keep them afloat and keep them alive. Uh, we created that ecosystem called Uber Direct. We do a lot of deliveries for that uh, in the US and now we launched it in Taiwan and Japan. Uh, we think uh, this ecosystem will of course have a layer of payments, right? So that payments layer needs to have accountability, needs to have creates data for them to see what is actually being their inventory, what is being sold, what is not being sold, uh, creates access for them in, in the marketing realm, right? And it just doesn't have to be Uber Direct. There, there are a bunch of players, like Saurabh mentioned. There's uh, going to be many unicorns in this place, uh, just catering to uh, mom and pop shops and creating that digital payments ecosystem for them. Um, one of the great examples here in, uh, I think, uh, if I could pick from India, is Bharat Pay, right? So they have really leveraged the QR system and an offline uh, sort of ecosystem in the country mm. to scale up, um, become one of the big growing unicorns and, and cater to this ecosystem. They can pr provide marketing services, uh, they can provide uh, accounting services, they can provide, um, you know, CRM. Uh, so all of the digital infrastructure, which is needed really, you know, uh, as you saw with, the, with, with Amazon creating AWS for the world, we, we now need to look at a level deeper and look at in, in, in that mm -hmm. deeper level, what that infrastructure is going to look like for small mom and pop shops. So that's where I think uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure and a lot of investment is going. And we want to play in that. Everybody wants to play in that, but it should be looked at from a lens of handholding rather than extracting value. I think that's, that's a key message. Understood. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, fun thing here, uh, for the panelists, how many of you, when you go to a restaurant and when, and go, uh, the first thing you do when you come time to pay the bills to check out which POS you are using, raise your hands. None? Really? Okay, see? Yeah, you know, it's a payment professional thing, yeah? You just have to see which POS they use. I, I feel it all the time. <laughs> uh, keeping, let's, let's continue on this. Uh, you know, mindful of time. Alternative payments now. Alternative payments for our audience members uh, includes anything that is basically not cash and not cuts itself. We are seeing huge growth in every single market. Uh, Suraj just not mentioned Dana, which is a wallet in Tunisia. This is just one of many, many different alternative payments available in Asia Pacific. What are the key trends we are seeing here? And who do you think is going to be the emerging player or which format of alternative payments will make sense? Let's start with Naveed. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, Ivan. So oh, yes. as, I mentioned, as, as I mentioned in my previous uh, response, yeah. the, fo the focus here isn't so much on the alternative aspect of the payments. It is rather on the holistic end-to-end -end, uh, solution and the consumer experience that, that Saurabh and, and Arman spoke about as well. Um, and therefore, I believe that players 
or payment partners who are able to provide this end-to-end -end experience, or as we call it, omni-channel business models, are the ones who are best placed to succeed in this environment. Uh, because if you're providing a very specific alternative payment proposition, chances are that it will be replicated easily by a competitor and you will mm -hmm. lose your competitive edge. However, if you're able to provide an omni-channel solution which covers payment gateways, payment options, alternatives, including buy now, pay later, then you will be valuable to a business and to their consumers. Now, in terms of mm -hmm. who, um, I think banks are very well placed um, and I, I'm biased, I, I say that. And the reason for that is, is we connect both businesses as well as consumers as part of our ecosystem. Um, and this is where I think we can capture not only the traditional side of the payments, but also the alternatives, um, including PNPL. So that would be my response, Ivan. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Stephanie might have a, a difference in opinion. Let's see. Stephanie, yes. Who will be the emerging right. trends in this alternative world? Right. Yep. Thanks, Navayat, for your input as well. So I mentioned briefly about the rising popularity of alternative payments earlier. One of the alternative payments that, that are very popular nowadays is BNPL. And we at Bleedly.com, we launched our own private label, BNPL. It was powered by Indodana in October 2020. And since then, we saw a very significant positive traction on both adoption and retention as well. And in fact, the people that use BNPL, they shop more and more frequent as well. Retention was very good. So we dig deep to find out why. We found out that, you know, first looking at customer experience with conventional payment methods in e-commerce, there were multiple friction points. Um, you know, they have to log in to mobile banking to make transfer. They have to wait for OTP code to process credit, credit card payments, or they even have to go to a convenience store to make payments. Uh, it's very, very, it's quite painful to do, right? And compare this to BNPL, where upon checking out, they just have to enter six digit PIN number. Friction is so much lower. It's a lot more convenient. And second, uh, for customers who are facing income reduction because of COVID, they were still able to use BNPL. They were able to continue their spending habits. And as you know, Indonesia have a large underbank and unbanked population. Only small percentage of people have credit cards. Therefore, you know, that's not even an option for them to begin with. And lastly, the application process for our BNPL is so easy and simple. It enables customers to make purchase right away after they get approved. Right. So that's so, like what I can share. Thanks, Ivan. You're welcome, Stephanie. So I'm hearing from Navi that, you know, uh, there are a lot of trends happening and banks, uh, by the nature of being a financial institution, are, are going to be a big force in this area. And from Stephanie, buy now, pay later is, uh, is, is something upcoming. So we, since she talked about buy now, pay later, this is a great time to ask uh, Sonil about buy now, pay later. Yes, no. And uh, how can merchants adopt? Okay, so, and how can merchants adopt from so many vendors? For context, when we are doing this live filming right now, yesterday, Tech in Asia published an article about the BNPL players in Southeast Asia. And as of counted, there are 16 of them, one six in Southeast Asia. So buy now, pay later, is it going to be good or bad? And how can we as merchants decide who to use? Sonia, over to you. Okay, well, uh, an interesting one. And I'm, I'm actually quite glad that, uh, you know, I, I heard so many good things about buy now, pay later. Um, because, uh, you know, when we actually launched buy now, pay later um, as, as Flipkart, and we have this product called Flipkart Pay Later, for instance, how Stephanie was talking about, right? Um, we launched it in, in 2017, and we were almost, uh, I think, the second player in this country to launch Flipkart Pay Later, right, at that point in time. Um, and I think, uh, yes, it's been like a massive shift and a turnaround in how, uh, how as a market, uh, whether it's a consumer or it's a merchant, how the perception of buy now, pay later has evolved. Um, and frankly, the concept of buy now, pay later, at least in emerging economies, has been there for quite some time. Um, it was definitely there in uh, unorganized retail market. Um, and it's just only now that it is seeing an increased resurgence through the digital transformation and implementation of it, right? Uh, which is primarily obviously due to the combination of uh, more tech savvy shoppers and drastically improved technical capabilities via fintech solutions. Um, so there is a suddenly, you know, the pay after delivery method, although not new, is still filling a void in the payment space and uh, I think is driving all of this excitement. Um, so I think what is going to happen is the buy now pay later, of course, is here to stay. But what I think uh, we all will notice as, as time moves on is that 
as this binary pay later becomes more and more deeper and i think if if some of the global stats that uh, you know we all have been reading about that binary pay later should actually contribute about uh, 3 to 5% of the overall organized retail online retail market right by 2023 um and that's if you look at it it's still a very minor number right because credit cards from that perspective are still sitting at about 23% so there is a massive gap that has to be done um so i think we're going to see some very quick evolutions at least in the emerging economies on how binary pay later will continue to grow and now it's going to be on the back of two things right one is how do you increase this consumer base because um especially in emerging economies and i'm going to take a cue from india where you're talking about at least 500 million consumers who you can extend binary pay later to but maybe if you take all i think there're only going to be about 100 120 million that would even have the opportunity to take binary pay later from one of the leading five players in the indian market uh, so i think that the opportunity from that perspective is going to be quite exciting over the next 3 years uh, to try to see which is the player that will try to go deeper and deeper to cater to a lot of segments right um, and when i say segments i mean consumer and i think very closely tied to this is uh, how do you ensure that the acceptance of binary pay later um continues to go deeper and deeper into the merchant segment as well because what will happen is that of course you've seen these uh, large digital platforms across the world right uh, where they are uh, offering their own white label pay later services um but there are these millions and millions of uh, you know small scale players that also want to offer binary pay later and therefore are looking for uh, you know uh, which which company to partner with and the question that i think will arise is which are going to be the one two leading players uh, that will have the highest extent of consumers available with them um and that is going to sort of you know change the game in some way but i also see what will happen at the same time and this could uh, this has happened in indian market as well over the last few years is that we have this growing layer of technology players which are called payment aggregators and payment gateways and what they will do is that they will essentially act as this um facilitator or enabler or the third party platform where they will on one side they will go and tie up with uh, you know all these 16 or 17 binary pay later players or whoever they want to and at the same time it will be a very simple single click touch integration for the merchant right so that is also something which is evolving in the market and i think time will tell which is going to be the best way to win um, but from my perspective i i see both the opportunities to be very very uh, impressive I all I heard after that was a three to five percent, and for context, that's more than some of our payment channels in some of our markets. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Sonil, and of course, uh, one of our partners, but um, Bandan, yes, this final pay letter, yay, nay. Yep, I think uh, uh, we can see from the number of buy now pay later players in different parts of the uh, market in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and that's a that's a sign, you know, how this uh, new payment method is upcoming, right? So. Mm-hmm. uh for us we started uh, gojek actually built uh, our own pay later solution back in 2018 and since then indonesia has been uh, you know we we heard about a new bnpl method almost every alternative year and this this market is sort of getting flooded but one of the things we found out during covid is uh, uh, i think it's important to look at bnpl not only from the e-commerce or the commerce provider but also from customer segments there have been couple of new customer segments that came up especially during covid one is affordability mm-hmm. segment which basically wants to make sure uh, in order to maintain their cash flow during these uncertain months uh, probably would want to buy something right now and pay for it at the end of the month and hence that leads to a better planning and budgeting throughout the month because it's essentially one bill at the end of the month or in 30 days that you pay uh secondly what we also saw is uh, uh a, a lot of segments actually moving towards more convenient payment methods and some of the points that stephanie touched upon where bnpl is much more seamless as compared to other payment methods uh, especially in in a in a closed loop ecosystem for example a lot of ecosystems today are providing their own bnpl methods and and uh, that is obviously more seamless than let's say using a third party bnpl method uh coming to the second part of the question uh of course there are multiple bnpl and how how does a merchant go about choosing them right and uh, i think couple of things are important uh, there are category specific uh, uh, you know customizations that obviously need to be done to bnpl for example a travel use case would be different from an e-commerce use case right For, from a perspective of average ticket size frequency of transactions and what is the what are the kind of limits you want to give on that bnpl product so that it can cater, uh, cater to that particular category uh the second one is what kind of customer segments uh, is the provider of the bnpl 
uh, you know, matching with the segments that the e-commerce or the commerce provider is providing. Uh, that's second. And the last one, not to forget, BNPL is still a credit, right? At the end of the day. So um, anyone who's providing BNPL would know that it's not only business of payments, but also they are in business of collecting the payments back, right? So I think a close yeah. collaboration, a close collaboration between the BNPL provider and the, uh, you know, wherever you're integrating, I think that's, that can be a game changer. If, if you can collaborate well on knowing your customers and how to collect that also can be a big uh, advantage. Yeah, thank you so much, Bandan. I think everyone's excited about co uh, collecting money at first, but forget that, yes, there is a credit part involved and you need to chase back the money eventually. This has been a, a great session. We're making so good time. Uh, we just want to give all our panelists here a chance to just say one or two ideas that they have uh, for our audience members to close us off today. So in no order of priority, Aman, anything else to close us off today? One line summary, I think, uh, you know, if you look at, UPI, I want to call out mm. uh, as one of the great revolutions and evolutions that I've seen in India, is about to cross PayPal in volume done annually. UPI only exists in India. PayPal exists all over the world. Um, UPI authorizes payments on the internet. PayPal uses Visa or MasterCard. Do we really need Visa or MasterCard in the future? <laughs> Well, thankfully, they're not our sponsors here today. But thank you so much. Uh, UPI is uh, the Unified Payment Interface for India. Thank you so much, Arman. Uh, Sonil, yes. Uh, yeah. I absolutely love the thought that Arman shared. I think, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the ecosystem is, is due for a change. But I think um, as, as we all evolve, right, and we get out of this uh, COVID world, I think harnessing the power of data and digitization um, to build new models of finance, right, and across verticals uh, that will simplify and improve accessibility and affordability um, across financial services for users is, is going to be uh, one of the tipping points and focus areas uh, for almost each and every emerging economy. So I think uh, over the next few years, we should just uh, keep focusing. And uh, we, after three years, when we all meet, I think we'll be in a different world altogether. All right, three years, all right. We're going to start counting down, Sonia. I will see you in three years' time, in the, at, uh, at least. Uh, Naveed. So I think just echoing those thoughts, and from my point of view, as payment experts, we almost get caught up with payments. So we should remember that payments is just incidental. It's the business end-to-end -end journey that we should focus on. So we should be an enabler of, uh, of an e-commerce business, not just payments, and that's the, the key takeaway. Payments enabler. Thank you so much, Naveed. Uh, Bandan? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the interesting uh, thing to see would be how various ecosystems and categories come up with their own uh, solutions to payments. Uh, uh, for so long, uh, uh, companies have been dependent on, you know, standard schemes and networks, which obviously has been important. Mm -hmm. But what's coming out is category-specific or ecosystem-specific payment methods, right? And I think that's something to look out for. Thank you so much, Bandan. Uh, Suraf? Subha? Yeah. I, uh, so echoing on some points what uh, Arman mentioned, right? So for me, I think payments are localized in nature. Uh, you, you don't have one payment which works across the world. Payments are super localized. So it will be that particular market, what sort of payment rails are built in that particular geography, which will be the dominant player going forward. We saw what happened once UPI was in India. We have fast plans to come in Indonesia. There could be a different sort of revolution which is coming here where, you know, your traditional payment methods, card networks might not be required and you can just, you know, directly pay from your accounts, right? It's just that the solutions are not there. So if, let's say, you have a central infrastructure, central payment rails built in different countries, which can, which have a good user experience and fast payment experience, I think that will be the clear winner in the future. Thank you. And we always like to end off with a female voice, Stephanie. All right, thanks, Evan. So I think we need better financial inclusion to accelerate growth and develop our economies. And you know, lastly, even though cashless payments are gaining more traction, the players must address top three concerns from consumers, which are security, privacy, and lastly, charges and fees. That's all. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists. It has been such a great honor here and this afternoon to be moderating this session. My name is Ivan. I think you can find any of us on LinkedIn. 
thank you so much. I think panelists, we can say, we can do a wave to thank everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank, everyone. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.